Welcome to Tea Time with Shaylee and Amber, the podcast where we talk about all the shit that your horse wants you to know and what you can do about it. Amber is a horse trainer and a personal results coach, certified in Theta and Semitic Breathwork. Shaylee is an animal communicator who also teaches communication. Both knowledge seekers with the intention of sharing that knowledge and hoping that we can encourage the listeners to do the same. Welcome to our chat with Felicity Davies. Felicity is a horsewoman, a host of the Equestrian Perspective podcast. She has an amazing program called The Confident Rider and puts a unique intuitive approach to helping horses and their people find harmony. This conversation is about blending horse training and energy work, a bit about how masculine and the feminine play a big role in our industry and so much more. I hope you guys enjoy this as much as we did. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the podcast. Today is super exciting because we're here with Felicity Davies. Um, It's kind of a super full circle moment because um, Felicity has the confident equestrian, no, it's not confident equestrian, that's your program. It's the equestrian Equestrian perspective (laughs) podcast which was the first podcast I ever did. And I was so freaking nervous. Um, and it ended up being a total blast. And now here we are on our own podcast. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I think it's really fun to do the full circle thing. And I always find it funny. Like, I think it's it's so interesting when you go on someone else's podcast at like how different it feels versus you hosting the episode. Like, yeah, it's, a, it's always an interesting dynamic, but it's fun and I'm glad to be here. Yeah, stoked to have you. Being the one asking the questions this time, kind of intimidating. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> for those of you who don't know Felicity, she is a horsewoman, a horsemanship and mindset mentor. She has a pod, super cool pod, actually, if you haven't heard of it yet. It's the Equestrian Perspective podcast. Um, she has a lot of really cool guests on there. Um, she has the Confident Equestrian program. She is just kind of an all-around intuitive badass with a super cool accent. Like, you'll love hearing her voice. So tune into her pod. Check out her program. But um, so I, I have never really asked you this, but you have, like, such an affinity for like the nervous person, you know, like the anxious Mm -hmm. person, people who are kind of fearful. How did you even get into that? Like, why, why are you drawn to that type of clientele? It's really interesting because when I first created the Confident Equestrian program, I didn't really think like equestrian is actually more referring to the person than the horse. I was just thinking this is for the horse. But then as always, for people that are having um, horses that lack confidence, and they want additional support, often that comes with the person also needing to build up their own confidence. And I think it just happened naturally because I used to be someone who didn't have a whole lot of confidence. I would outsource my um, decision-making to everybody else, sort of follow all of the shoulds in my life until I had my satin return and all of these things came up for me. My life went through like a crazy journey Um, And then I went on this journey of like, oh my goodness, I can like learn to trust myself and learn to build up my confidence and go on this journey. And I think what's been really cool about that is when I'm working with clients, I can really resonate with where they're coming from, at least in some capacity. And also I can resonate struggling with my horses. So it's like, because I have a whole lot of empathy and compassion there, then I find I can make really good headway. And I don't know... But I feel like with me, I will just, I think this is in my human design as well, but people will just open up to me. And because I'm such a naturally curious person, like it'll be one call, but we've already spoken about stuff that they've never spoken about with other people before. Um, So I just think it's just naturally happened this way. (laughs) You totally are someone. I remember like doing our first, because I've done like a couple of healing sessions with you now and Um, I remember doing the first one being like, is this confidential? Like, are we going to become friends? Because uh, I don't know if I should be telling you this, but here we go. Like, here's my life story. (laughs) Oh my goodness. Like, and doing those sessions as well. um, I'm always just so curious and so fascinated. Like there's nothing I think that I haven't heard. (laughs) 
like nothing. And it's just like, it really just, when you have that much insight into a person's experience or just the human experience in general, you just realize that we're not alone in any of our experiences. And the more you can feel comfortable sharing those things and getting to the root cause of what's going on, the more transformation you can make in the direction that you want to go in. And it's just, it's cool to see people opening up more and more and more. And like, even I had a first call with a new group of students. And in the first call, there was already like crying, acknowledgement of how like proud their horse is of them, acknowledging like some grief, like all of this stuff coming up in the first call. And I'm like, where are we going to be at by week 12? <laughs> this is cool. Yeah. It's such a superpower to be able to hold space for people and have them feel safe enough to like divulge yeah. all of that. And you said something when you were talking and you said you um, had had your sudden return and then there was this process of you having to learn to trust yourself. Like what did that mm-hmm. look like for you? Because I know that's such a big thing that people struggle with. Mm-hmm. Like how, but how do I know? How do I trust myself? How do I, you know, and how do I know? Totally. And if you said to me in the past, like, you should just trust yourself. I would have been like, F off. Like, how, how do you do this? Like, good for you, but how? Um, So for me on my journey, it was really just a series of life events that happened to me where I was forced to listen to my gut response. Um, And fortunately, even though it felt like the worst thing in the world at the time, like I was in a job or multiple jobs um, after doing a degree that I didn't really love. Um, And then, yeah, in multiple jobs that were pretty good. Um, And I just had this gut feeling like, I'm not meant to be here. Like this just isn't lighting me up at all. Um, I would quit those jobs, get another job in the same industry, same kind of thing would happen or I'd have conflict with my boss and all of this other stuff. Um, So then I just started making these decisions that terrified me and a lot of people, like family members, didn't really understand what the hell I was doing. So it's like, why are you giving up these good experiences? Um, And then, yeah, it, it was just like, the universe was planting these seeds for me um, to respond to. And so I quit this job, but then I was like, I'm going to start my own business because I would rather like worst case scenario, I can pick up horse poo in the paddock that will pay for my horses if I need to. And I started um, just going, I can design a website or I can create logos. And I didn't have any background in this. I was just like, eh, I'll just do it. Um, did a bit, a few pieces there, um, had casual jobs. And then this ad popped up on Facebook from this trainer that I was following um, that said like they're looking for a groom working student and this was um, to work at a stable in Germany, a horsemanship and dressage stable. And I was like, oh, this would be amazing. Spoke with my friend about it, pipe dream kind of thing. And I just thought, what calm can it do to just inquire? Like I'm in Australia, he's in Germany. Like they're not going to want someone in Australia anyway. He's going to deny it. It's going to be good. He didn't deny it. We had a conversation. He was like, when are you booking your ticket? And I was like, oh, damn. (laughs) So it was just this series of events. And then I decided to go. Um, And initially with that decision, my my mom was even like, you've wasted your degree. And then a week later, she was like, I wish I could have done something like that when I was younger. Um, So it was just this full turn of events. Um, Went overseas, still lacked a lot of confidence. And then when I came back from overseas, um, back to Australia, I was navigating a lot of personal stuff, heartbreak, um, like grieving that I had leased my horse out because I thought I was going to stay overseas for longer. I had no car. I was living at my parents, no job. Um, and I was like, now I have to get to know me. Shit. <laughs> well, shit. I remember even writing a list of like, what do I even like? <laughs> I wrote down this list of things that I like. Um, And that really like started my more like deeper healing journey. So yeah, I just think life planted all these seeds on my path. But I would say in terms of trusting yourself, it's really just you can look back on the, the times where you've had these intuitive hits, these moments where you're like, okay, I need to do these things. And the more you can cultivate evidence of like listening to that worked for me in the past or not listening to that didn't work for me, the more I think you can kind of cultivate your own sense of, self-trust and I'm still on this journey I think we all are um to different levels but yeah that's a that's a bit of an overview it was it was kind of uh, chaotic (laughs) no I think it's so good because I think that's such a question that comes up so often you know and we talked a little Mm -hmm. bit before we started about 
taking your power back and that sort of just goes right into it where you're having to sit and say I have all of these different options I have all these different professionals I have all of this choice mm-hmm. in front of me which should be really amazing but now I'm overwhelmed and all this self-doubt is coming in and you know so I think mm-hmm. that's something that's such a prevalent thing in people's lives so I think it's so relevant to hear that like cycle of mm-hmm. it's interesting because I, I also hear people get hung up on well if something's scary, you say yes to it, but also is that my gut saying, don't do the thing? (laughs) Like, you know, like how you can tell and decipher between the two things, you know, is it, is it making you nervous because it's stretching you and pushing you to do like the next thing? Or is it making you nervous because you're not supposed to do it? Um, Yeah. mm -hmm. Yeah. It's really interesting to kind of decipher. And yeah, I just got off of a mentoring call with my mentor, Helen Wilkes, and she was talking all about how, and it was a really beautiful conversation. And she was just saying how often we wrong ourselves for feeling our power or not feeling our power. So it's like when you feel this urge, this power in your body, often it's just like, oh my God, I'm anxious. Oh my God, like, what do I do with myself? Oh my God, like, we don't know where to channel it or how to channel it because of the stories that are blocking you from actually, um, like going down that road or when we don't feel the sense of power in our bodies, we think I'm useless. Something's wrong with me. I've all my creativity is gone. I'm just like, what is my life? Like, and it's just this state of wronging ourselves all the time. But when you can like her invitation and I'll, I'll share this with you guys was when you feel power, where does, where is it in your body? Like, how does that sensation come through for you? And is there a pattern? Because the more you can start to get used to what does this pattern feel like specifically for me, because everyone's going to have a unique kind of feeling that comes up for them, then you can start to realize, oh, this is my pattern and this is what my power actually feels like. And then you can start to separate your power from the stories that you're telling yourself, which might be fear driven. So it's I think it's so nuanced, um, but I think it's a conversation that not a lot of people have. And I think with horse owners as well. They are so powerful, so powerful. And like going on this more compassionate horse horsemanship journey, this intuitive journey, they're forced to come face to face with that. And there's a lot of stuff that comes up along the way because God forbid you accept your power and you realize that you can have all like most of the things, if not all of the things that you actually want. Like that's something that I'm facing at the moment. And it's like, ah, oh, I'm the only one holding me back. <laughs> Damn. so yeah it's a lot I know Amber and I have talked about this a a little bit like the almost like identity crisis where you do kind of give your power away and I like I kind of had this realization this year where I'm like damn my identity is so wrapped up in my horses and like my happiness feels almost conditional and it's funny how you're like saying that you have to write down like, okay, what do I like? Cause I went through that only recently where I'm like, who the F am I like outside of horses? And like, like if I'm not the horse girl or like the animal communicator, what even am I? And I had to go through that process of kind of like calling my power back and realizing like what my identity was. And it is kind of crazy how like, I don't know if it's society or if we're like born this way or what, but it's almost like we're taught to like silence our voices at such a young age. And then we end up becoming, um, I I had a horse tell me recently, she has this idea of who I am. And this is not like, she likes the idea of me. She has created an idea of me, but I am not the horse for her. And I thought that was so interesting because I do Mm -hmm. kind of feel like we create this idea of, who we are too, like this little external shell. And then the more you, horses bring it out of us. Like the more we meet other horse people or we spend more time with horses, they like crack down that little idea of us that we believe we are. And then we're left like, oh God, who am I? (laughs) Totally. And it's such like a big thing to look at. And I think it's just, I think we're always going to be we always evolve. And that's the trippy thing about it, because I think you can have a sense of, okay, this is who I am in this moment. But I also need to be flexible enough to know that that's going to pivot and change because I am on this journey called life, and I'm not going to be the same person forever. And I think um, 
sometimes like even in this conversation um, that I had with my mentor just before, she was just like, as you're going on this journey and probably in the stages where you're questioning your identity or you're moving into somewhere else, like in order to step into that next phase of you, you have to grieve the loss of the version of you that you're hanging on to. And it's like, often that's the piece that we don't want to do because it's like, oh, okay, well, if I'm not holding on to the label of being the, like in your instance, being the animal communicator who rides horses, like, I really liked her. I really liked holding on to her. And like, if I let that go, then who am I? Or then what am I? And what do I lean on? And it's just this uh, constant journey that I think we, like, it sounds like, oh yeah, you, you should just be able to do this. or you should just be flowing. It's like, it's more nuanced than that. <laughs> There's a lot of layers. Uh, yeah. Hanging out with Amber has been such a adventure because um <laughs> she just is like forcing me to look into things like prior to her my communication sessions were like were this is what's going on in the physical body this is how your horse feels that's it now it's like you know she asked ask me questions like the horses have belief systems and I'm like oh I don't know I don't know if they do and then I go through my sessions and I'm like well, yeah, they kind of do have belief systems because a horse will tell me I have a really good work ethic. And then I start to question, I'm like, okay, well, is that like the horse thinking that or is that the person thinking that? But I've had several sessions recently that really have me thinking that Amber is onto something that they have their own little belief systems because um, I had a horse tell me the other day, I am like super powerful. I'm very forward. I'm this, I'm that. And the person like came back and was like, this horse is a slug. We can't get him forward. We have all these problems with him, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, wow, this horse has his total own belief system about like who he is. And mm -hmm. it's not aligning with the person. And it's so interesting because now I really do believe like, okay, so we have our own belief systems and they have their own belief systems and now it's a lot more complicated to get along together. <laughs> I'm so like curious to see like how your sessions unfold. Cause I remember like after one of the sessions that um, we did together and afterwards you were like, so all of this stuff's coming up in my sessions now. Like, cause it's like, once it's exposed, it'll just kind of pop up into your um, existence. You can't, you can't, um, it, ignore it um but no I think it's really interesting and I mean it makes total sense like their their own being they're living their own lived experience and yeah you you definitely see some of those horses and I think it's interesting going back to the conversation of power and this horse saying that he's really powerful but then expressing like perhaps not being so powerful to his owner because he's a bit of a slug so she said um it's really just like for those horses that do lack um motivation like when working with us it's really probably just a misdirection of power so like he's just like I do have all this power inside of me it's just been misdirected or you're not like actually allowing me to tap into it so I'm just not going to use it and that's probably the story of like a lot of people too <laughs> yeah yeah I feel like it's such an interesting thing with that because when you say yes I have all this power it's just being misdirected or it's not being you know, expressed in, in a way that resonates with the, the human part. Right. And there's so many people that say they want their horse to be forward or say they want their horse to be powerful or say they want all of these things from their horse, but like an actual, their body is like, please, no, I don't actually want that. So mm -hmm. there's just such a, um, there's just such a crossed amount of cross wires happening within there where their minds and their bodies, people are just so disconnected from their bodies that they don't even know what they're actually asking of their horse. So it's just yeah. kind of crazy how they poke at us and invite us to explore more <laughs> of our own stuff. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And I think with that as well, like with the crossing over of like someone saying they want something, but then actually not really wanting to receive it. It's probably because it's a conditioned thing. Like, oh, everyone says I should want this or that looks good for them, but they haven't actually considered, okay, well, what's that actually going to look like for me? And how does that actually feel for me? Does that really feel safe? Um, and I think this inquiry piece is something that often a lot of people don't do. And like, I'm sure we all do this in certain areas of our life, how we go like, oh yeah, I think I want this. And then when you actually stop to consider it or you stop to consider, oh, I've been talking about something, but how does that actually feel? Or like, 
what does this actually mean? Or how does this show up in my life? Or how is this going to impact things? Then you get more depth to it. And it's, yeah, it's a journey. (laughs) Yeah. And it kind of circles back to that whole taking your power back and figuring out who you are. Because we just had a clinic here and there were so many people that were come from different trainers and, you know, different disciplines and different experiences. And it was like, well, well, of course, this is what I want. And it was like, okay, but why do you want that? And people are like, mm-hmm. no idea. <laughs> because I've been told that's what I should be trying to get. And it's like, if you understand the why behind it, you can understand if that's actually something you want or not. Yeah. And being able to like understand it from a more, you know, when you talk about different postures of horses and um, the biomechanics of stuff and like the nervous systems and all of these pieces that get smashed together and then trainers that are so in tune with that and then trainers that are completely disconnected from it. People are just so whiplash, <laughs> especially because I feel like right now there is such a transition of the way horsemanship yeah. is going that mm-hmm. they're just regurgitating stuff and not knowing why. And, and then when they come to a clinic, I just did a clinic with Lockie. And when they come to a clinic like that and you give them permission to explore, does that feel good to you when your trainer requests X, Y, Z from you or, mm-hmm. you know, and they're like, well, and I, other people too will message me like, oh, I'm seeing this different stuff, but I'm with this trainer at this barn. I don't know how to say it. It makes me uncomfortable. And also other trainers who are trying to transition from their mm-hmm. identity of this performance horsemanship or whatever discipline they're in, transitioning to something that's a little bit more, you know, focused on the relationship piece. And it's like, if you really educate yourself into a deep enough place where you fully understand why you're doing the things, it's like super easy to, I don't even want to say defend, but take your power and say why, right? Like, Mm, totally. And I think it, in order to do that, you have to actually understand like, what do I want? mm -hmm. Which I don't think a lot of people know what they want. Like you said, it's a conditioned thing. Like, okay, well, with horses okay well I get a horse then I'm to ride like that's what I want to do because that's what people say I should do okay I ride okay well then maybe I compete because people say you compete or you go to riding club or you do that you take a horse out on weekends you go try riding whatever you do okay well I do that and like this was my story as well I competed uh, show horses for a decade and I was going to competitions every single weekend, a lot of times going there to win a ribbon and come home as fast as I could so I could get my qualification. Like, love the lessons, love the training, still enjoyed it. But I was like, oh, let's just go to this show because I need to earn this thing so I can get points to go to the bigger show. Then we'd go to the bigger show and like not be good enough there anyway. And I'm like, it took me 10 years to get to this point at the end of it all because I yeah series of events led me to this place where I had this beautiful horse my horse Bruce was competing him he would do like pour his heart out even though he was like not 100% okay um and like lame horses were winning over us and like fair enough my horse's confirmation isn't the best um and he was sold to me by a coach who was like he's going to win at all of these shows and I believe that um and then it was just came crashing down like one day where I looked at him and I was like he's not happy. I'm not happy. Why are we doing this? Right. And like, that was a real pivotal moment for me to be like, holy shit, I've spent 10 years doing things that everyone's told me I should do. Like that was probably actually the main pivotal moment of me questioning, like, what the F do I want? Like, what do I want? Um, So yeah, I think it's interesting with that conversation because a lot of people haven't actually had that conversation with themselves around like, what do I want with my life? And like, can I have it? Yeah. Yeah. My little horsemanship journey is so weird right now because I had to go through like a few months of feeling guilty for not riding. Like I didn't have a desire to ride, didn't want to, just wanted to enjoy my horses and like look at them out my window, but not necessarily do anything with them. And I'm like, why the hell do I feel so guilty about this? It's so strange. Like I should be doing something with you. Your muscles are wasting away. Like, and it's, it's so interesting because we're kind of gearing up to do this, like elements of connection clinic. And I connected with like the horse collective because I was like, 
feeling like I didn't know what I had to offer to the clinic. Like I'm like, yeah, animal communication, but like, I don't know. And, um, <laughs> Amber's like, oh gosh, this story. Um, cause she's been hearing about it like all week. <laughs> but so basically the horse collective has told me to give up my eyesight because I'm addicted to it. Like I, as soon as I wake up in the morning, I put my contacts in or I wear glasses and I cannot even wear sunglasses because I don't like walking into a room and not being able to see. Like I, I really am addicted to like clear vision. And they were like, well, you have sight, but you have no vision. And that's why you don't understand what you have to offer. So quit wearing your glasses until you come to this clinic. And I was like, oh, fuck. Okay. So Amber's been hearing about it every day because I'm like, I am so spooky. Like I, I literally screamed at a leaf because I thought it was a mouse. Um, I almost mucked my black chicken out of the stall. Like my vision is not good. And so I've had to like give up this vision and start to like feel into my other senses. And it, I will say it's insane because my sense of smell, I kid you not, it's only been like four days. I swear I can smell better. Like I start smelling like the honeysuckles. And, but what I've noticed the most is that I am not critical about anything. Like these last four days, I've had the most fun hanging out with my horses because I can't fucking see them. So like, I'm not looking at their muscles. I'm not looking at their feet. I'm not like picking apart anything or being critical. It's like the freaking coolest thing ever. And I can't even remember why I started this story, but <laughs> it's like a, a different perspective. And it's so interesting how like, I don't know, just the journey that like our horses take us on. And um, yeah, that's where I'm at right now. <laughs> yeah, that's super cool. and. Yeah, I mean, you're right. Like, what an invitation to release some of those old stories because you literally cannot see them and you cannot, like, the, the triggers aren't there for you to kind of go into that pattern um, and just really focus on your feeling and not, like, going back to what we spoke about earlier about, like, not wronging your process, like, not making it wrong. Because I'm sure in those moments where you can see clearly and the horses probably are okay, it's like, oh, well, the, the part of you that's addicted to, maybe like making sure that everything's perfect and making sure that they're, they're going to be okay. And like, Oh, I better spot these things. Like I think a lot of people um, on their horsemanship journey are very, very good at that. They're very good at picking out what isn't working and hyper fixating on that. But then it, the balance is off. Like where's the desire? Where's the connection? Where's the joy? Like you need to have a balance of the both. Otherwise you're just always leaning in that direction. Your horses can feel it which is probably where the horse collective is like, we're going to take a glasses away. <laughs> so she cannot see. And so she can realize that this thing is right here that she can have if she just chooses to tune into it and we're going to force her to. So here you go. <laughs> it's so yeah, interesting. So crazy. Oh, no, it's just the focus, what you'd said about focusing on all the things that aren't working. Mm. Because I think when you ride or when you work with your horse, it's our human brain craving finding out what's wrong to make it better and to get it fixed because it's not right or whatever and I have had a couple sessions with a client who her um her intention is to be able to ride bridalist and this is a horse that I worked with this woman like seven years ago or something and the horse uh, the reason I was called out to the barn is because he had been bucking her off and so I told her seven years ago you're gonna ride bridalist one day and she was like yeah okay <laughs> like but she's back in my life at the barn and, um, everything is, you know, so much better, but that was like this next thing that we had talked about. And, you know, in the focus of, oh, well, he's leaning here, he's pulling here, this is happening. I was like, well, what happens when you don't have any reins? Mm. And then I started thinking, we're always so focused on what's not working, what to do about it. And I was like, what about all of the things that he's doing so well that seven years ago you were terrified of? So I had her well, the first session I had her do gratitude in every corner of the arena, just like start spitting out things that she was grateful for that were working. And then mm -hmm. today I had her do gratitude on the short side and transitions in the corner <laughs> and then downward transition into gratitude on the short side and back because I was like, are you actually embodying what it feels like to be grateful, to be satisfied with what's happened to be open, you know? Yeah 
this flow to come through. You're asking your horse to have this flow, but you're like, look at all the things that are wrong, you know? And I feel like so many people do that. Like, how do you integrate, like breaking that pattern of going straight into these are all the things that aren't working that I need fixed. And that's why I'm taking this lesson with you because we are all broken and shit. <laughs> and it's, like, <laughs> it's so weird that we're so hyper fixated on the brokenness. Yeah. So much good shit. Like, Totally. And yeah, even an experience with my mentor the other week, I was like, oh, pondering these like business decisions. And she was like, nothing's wrong. Nothing's wrong with you. Nothing's wrong with them. Like everything's working. There's nothing that you need to do. You're not broken. Nothing's wrong. And sitting with that for me feels more uncomfortable than doing because I've been doing my whole life. And I think a lot of us have been doing our whole lives. So when you sit in the space of like, oh, nothing is wrong and I'm allowed to enjoy this moment and then even I've been working on receiving because I'll receive a lot of like nice messages and things like that but there's still a disconnect between like actually like soaking it in in my body and holding that in my body and letting it be anyway classic universe on the last group call for the confident equestrian program that finished the other week um at the end one of the women was like oh we have a a present for you and they made this video they put together themselves of them like saying how much they love the program and their transformation I sat there crying for three minutes then I proceeded to finish the call keep watching it keep crying for ages and ages and ages and ages wiped me out the whole fucking day because I was like oh my god I'm not used to feeling this this is a lot (laughs) I'm forced to feel this and coming back to the power piece it's also a recognition of you you have like this is a recognition of your power that wants to be accepted and like tuned into and I think for um, horse owners as well like your client when she's working with a horse and things are going well and feeling more harmonious or even if they're not perfect it's an acceptance of like her power like I can do this like that's a lot (laughs) I feel like I've said that like after every sentence that I say I just pause and go it's a lot Well, speaking of a lot, I'm curious your um, perspective on this and Amber too, actually. So I feel like I'm in this weird place. I've been there for a while where I almost feel responsible. I didn't. So in animal communication, I like to offer the information and then I like to have a solution. And I never really felt a responsibility piece until I started hanging out with Amber, actually, which is kind of funny because she feels responsible for everything. Um, But now it's like so interesting because I have this like responsibility piece now that I'm starting to get more into like the healing side of things where Mm -hmm. I will offer the answers like I will say what the animal has to say, but then I feel responsible for helping them let that go. Mm. And I don't, it's interesting navigating that because when I do my sessions with you and when I do my sessions with Amber, you guys almost like witness the healing. Like you, when I do my sessions with you, you guide me. Like I have the words, I have the answers and you're like guiding me to that. And it's very similar with Amber too. Like she guides you to have those answers. She doesn't put the words in my mouth. And with animals, I find this weird space where it's like, I don't want to put the words in their mouth, but like, how do you manage that responsibility piece as you're like on your, as you're facilitating these healing journeys? Like, how do you not feel responsible? Is it because you're working with the human or is it just like, you understand that people have to come to terms on their own? Yeah. So I think you can do the same thing with the horses. It might just take a little bit longer if that's the, if that's what the part of you that's seeking that needs. But it also could be the case of like maybe there is a part of you that also needs to acknowledge that you doing a process with the horse or shifting some energy, like that is potent and enough. You know, like that in itself is enough if that's what you feel called to do and trusting the responsibility piece is like, okay, well, in terms of responsibility um maybe your responsibility is like okay what I feel called to in that moment is enough so it's just navigating that and this is something that as I'm speaking this like I'll continue to work on because I'm someone who wants to kind of 
oh, I find, I see this thing and I want to, once again, like go into the pattern of like, oh, can I fix this? Can I tweak this? Can I move into this? Because it's like a fun and curious process. Um, and it's just working out like, is that what's needed in that moment? Or is just you planting the seed, like exactly what's needed in that moment? And that's enough. And if that's all you felt called to share, or if that's all you had time for, trusting that that's all that was needed and like handing the responsibility back over to the horse, to the human, to the client. I mean, like, okay, I've done my part. You're doing your part. If you need more of this, like you can always come back to me or seek additional support. Like you're not the only person out there to cure everything, you know? Um, And yeah, as I'm saying, this this is a message that I need to receive as well. But I think it's very, once again, it's very nuanced. It's a lot. (laughs) I'm curious to hear what Emma has to say. (laughs) Um, yeah, that's my, like my nemesis shadow that I'm always like, no, of course I'm not responsible. I'm just creating trainer. I'm just, you know, maybe throwing out some words that you say and reflecting them back to you so you can hear them and make your own meaning. But it's like a constant because it gets, it sneaks up on you when you don't in ways that you wouldn't even expect. Like, I think mostly I'm, I had, well, I had, you know, I had some trauma from my childhood where I had carried responsibility, even though I wasn't. And my people pleasing tendencies were really wildly out of control for most of my life. And so then you go into a career coaching people, which is like, (laughs) you know, so my thing was, I was really uncomfortable with people being uncomfortable for a long time. Like that would hang me up so bad. So the moment I would see anybody going into a conversation that was hard or something that they were like, oh gosh, or you could tell that they were um, being a little bit triggered and and finding things that were like crunchy spots. I would immediately be like, oh gosh, my job is to make you feel better, which is totally not your job as somebody facilitating Mm -hmm. sessions at all. (laughs) Um, Mm -hmm. But once I let go of that, that piece really isn't there. I'm totally comfortable with people being uncomfortable now. Um, But I think it's because I had to go through that yeah like really get uncomfortable and until I really got uncomfortable did I believe with my full body that people would be okay because I Mm. think I think before I didn't know because I hadn't done it right so I'm telling you you're gonna you know you'll be able to work through this and I was like I don't know I'm still Mm -hmm. (laughs) so Mm -hmm. it's really about like living it you know what I mean and living through it being able to hold the space for someone to be like, oh my gosh, this is it. And it's like, yeah. sometimes you just need to sit in that to gain the healing and it has to come from you doing it. So no matter what you say or offer to someone that is not ready to receive it, it's not going to matter anyways, but that's a sneaky one, especially for people that are doing what we are doing and anybody in a field that's like facil- mm-hmm. any type of anything, right? It's like, you're there because there's something inherently either from trauma or just you're born with it Mm -hmm. that makes you want to make people feel better. And so when you realize it's not the making the feel better is not the goal, right? It's like creating the the healing to happen how it needs to, but that's Mm -hmm. also giving people their power back in a way. You know what I mean? Like you don't need me. You don't need Uh so-and-so or Mm so-and-so. I can support you. But at the end of the day, like you are the one that has the power to do this for yourself. So I think it's really about like a gift yeah. back to them, you know, but it's yeah. A yeah, absolutely. I resonate with everything that you shared. And I think a lot of people that get into spaces like that or working with people, working with horses, like it would make sense that they've had some sort of um, story around that or conditioning around that sense of responsibility or enjoying being in that role. Absolutely. I can totally relate to that. Um, another thing I was going to say is I what I've reflected on recently is um, Basically, I'm moving into a space where I've been expanding my capacity to hold larger groups of people. And the people pleasing part of me is not happy because she she wants to make sure that everybody gets their needs met, speak to everybody, everybody's happy, everybody's comfortable. Because God forbid I have a bigger group and I don't get a chance to speak to someone on one call and they're just sitting and observing in the background. Anyway, then I reflect on I've been in spaces where I've been in groups and I haven't said anything and I found it an amazing experience. I've been in spaces where I haven't had all of the boxes ticked off or been fixed in one hour and it's been exactly what I needed. I needed to just meet myself at that spot and know that that was okay. So it's recognizing how I've like 
put myself on this sneaky pedestal in a way of being like, oh, well, I can do that, but other people can't. And it, like you said, it's giving people the power back and being like, no, they are a human being. They are powerful. And if I choose to see them in that way, and if, if I choose to see them and their horses in that way, they're going to get exactly what they need. And I'm going to attract people that are also re- ready to receive that as well. So it's just, it's really interesting where you're like, oh, well, I would do that, but other people might not. And it's like, fuck off. <laughs> oh, goodness. <laughs> oh, so good. So good. Um, but you, and so, I mean, I guess it's kind of getting close to the time we need to wrap up. I'm sure that we should probably do this again, but <laughs> um I know you have a new program that you are running, but is it the doors are open or they're closed or you're doing it again? Do you want to talk a little bit about it? Because I keep seeing stuff about it. I'm like, that's really freaking cool that someone in horsemanship land is pulling in that intuitive piece because it's so needed. And um, I loved Mm -hmm. that you were doing that. So, yeah. Yeah. So I've just started the next group. Um, Yesterday I started. Um, So the next round won't start until October, but Basically, it's just happened as this beautiful evolution because the Confident Equestrian program is really a program that has harnessed like all the horsemanship stuff that I've learned um, and really gives people a good gateway to trusting themselves and reconnecting back to themselves through their horse, getting them there. (laughs) And then what I found is a lot of people wanted to dive deeper now that they were more open um, and like happy to go there. And I've woven in some healings into the Confident Equestrian program that a lot of people really love. Um, And then through, I just love teaching. So the Intuitive Equestrian is really just about guiding people on a journey to feel safe enough to explore their intuition and connect with their intuitive gifts connect um, with animals and learn how to read energy. So there's, that's the first part. And then the second part is more diving into the healing. Um, and it's really diving into different healings that, that are for the group and also that they can explore outside of the group and with their horses. Um, and it's just a really beautiful space if people are wanting to connect more with their intuition and really, like we're talking about in this conversation, access their power and harness their power and realize like that they are freaking magic because they are. <laughs> I'm sure everybody that listens to this podcast, especially like you guys are all so damn intuitive. Um, and when you give people like prompts and guidance to tune into that, it's like, oh my goodness, like you guys are the coolest people ever. So anyway, I didn't do the best job explaining that, but it's a three month program and I'm obsessed with it. <laughs> <laughs> Shadley, do you want to say something? <laughs> yeah, that's freaking awesome. Um, everyone is so intuitive. Like everyone that I've taught um has been able to pick up on animal communication. Like it's just so freaking cool. And I love that like it's becoming more available. And um, I really love what you're doing. We did so um I posted your beautiful face in our membership and asked if anyone had questions, and mm. we did have one question I don't know if she's in the confident equestrian program or if she's in your new thing but um Brittany she said loved her recent mare collective session it was very healing and magical uh she had a question in what ways can we embrace the divine feminine of our mares but still set boundaries one mare getting jealous of the other specifically and she also wants to know how you practice embracing the divine feminine in your own life oh big question so Um, basically I hosted a free experience where I, I had been feeling it just to give you guys some context. I had been feeling into this thing around doing a healing for the mayor collective, just because of all of the trauma, a lot of mayors have gone through being misunderstood in relation to just how their body functions. Um, and also weaning practices and things like that. Um, so I thought it would be really beautiful to do a healing for that. Anyway, and just as a bit of a, I don't know why, I already said I'm doing a backstory. Anyway, we we realize now I'm doing a damn backstory. (laughs) But for this experience, I was like, I want to put something on to give people a taste of this program that I'm running so that they can feel into it and also give them a really beautiful experience. And like an hour before the class had started, I still hadn't downloaded the actual thing that I was going to do. And I was like, any minute now would be good. Like, uh, can this come through? Anyway, um. And then what wanted to come through me was doing a calling in the mayor collective, um, 
having this group of women that showed up for the experience um, and doing a healing to basically allow them to access their divine feminine and release anything that wasn't serving them and having the mares be present with that and then flipping it and doing the same thing for the mares. Um, And it was really, really cool and really beautiful. Um, So can you please ask me the first question that she asked again? And she, I'm pretty sure Brittany, she has joined the next round. She signed up early for the next round. So don't know her that well yet. I would not be surprised because she's like totally on board with all the things. Um, She said, in what ways can we embrace the divine feminine of our mares, but still set boundaries? She has one mare that's getting jealous of the other. I'm trying to like sit with this one for a bit because I feel like it's once again a really like I think it just comes back to a state of acceptance around all of that like acceptance around okay well if one mayor's getting jealous of the other like where are you making that wrong you know like how can you be in a state of acceptance around that and what are the the needs behind both of their experiences and how can you learn from those moments um because I think sometimes we go oh my horse is getting pushed around or this thing happening and is it like does the other horse even care (laughs) are they actually okay like is there anything wrong with that um and I think as well like being in a place where you're witnessing either your horse or somebody else be in a state where they're very like here's my boundary this is what I'm accepting or this is what I'm choosing to do Um, it's also coming to terms with like, okay, well, how comfortable do you feel like once again, owning what you want, asking people to do something for you, like claiming your space. (laughs) So I think it's all about like looking at all of these pieces and obviously like you can see the, the light side of that and the shadow side of that, um, coming through and just really reflecting on those pieces and reflecting on, okay, well, how can you harness this space of being like, okay, well, if I access this divine feminine within inside of me, uh, divine feminine inside of me that has this really big, potent, powerful, that word again, energy, um, what does that look like for me? And how can I get myself to a space where I can own my wants and desires? I can recognize my power and understand how powerful I am. And I can realize that with power and with being in my divine feminine doesn't mean that I have to please everybody else. It doesn't mean that everybody else has to like me and it doesn't mean that everyone else has to understand what I'm doing, which is like so evident with this mare that's like pushing the other horses around it or like with the jealousy thing going on. It's like, okay, well, how can you look at that and just be like, okay, well, is there anything wrong here? Does that make any sense? It just kind of came out of me. Amber's nodding. This is good. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, it totally did. And then, you know, what I, I find is when we talked about separation anxiety a little bit, and we talked about just random things and like behaviors that people want to fix or, or they mm-hmm. find wrong or right because it triggers something within them. And I, I don't know if this is true for people you've worked with, but I find that like, if you're in those moments and it's bringing up, like there's like an, a dominant emotion that's coming up for you in that moment, like identifying mm-hmm. what it is and why it's so upsetting for you. And once yeah. you get to the bottom of that, the behavior sometimes resolves on its, on its own. <laughs> you know what yeah. I mean? That lesson that was coming through for you has then been identified and acknowledged. Mm-hmm. And then the horses are like, okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you for learning oh. from us. <laughs> Next. <laughs> yeah. Even um, I did a masterclass about separation anxiety and I was speaking with a friend who's an occupational therapist and she works a lot with parents and children. And I was like, oh, like you'd have an insight on this because kids can have separation anxiety. And everything that she told me about in terms of the process of supporting the child was all to do with the parent. all to do with the parent and like, okay, how comfortable are they in the moment? Can they actually hold space? How How is their nervous system? Because the child needs to be able to regulate with their nervous system. Um, and also is the child in a supportive environment that they can actually feel safe in? And it's like, makes sense. <laughs> makes sense. Like, can we do the same thing with our horses? Yeah, it's interesting. Sorry, what was the next part of the question, Jaylee? <laughs> Well, first, I just, I don't want to go down too big of a rabbit hole because I don't want to keep you forever, but it's just so interesting because this, this feminine thing has been coming up for me a lot. And 
I was thinking the other day, like the first thing that we do when we get our animals is we like spay and neuter them or we castrate them. And like, we don't even ask them, like they never get a, a choice at all. And then the, the first thing that we hear as kids are like, you know, don't get pregnant. Like if you get pregnant at a young age, like I'm going to be pissed. Like, I just remember like getting like shamed by my parents, like, you know, <laughs> don't have sex, don't get pregnant. And it's interesting. Like I totally shoved my feminine power down for like the majority of my life because I was in that, like, don't get pregnant. And then when I got older, I was like, well, do I even want kids? Have I even allowed myself like the ability to like, think like, is that something I want? Can I make that decision for myself? And it's interesting to me how we do that to our animals. Like I have a puppy right now and I'm like, oh yeah, like I let her go through her, uh, her first heat cycle and then I'm going to spay her. And she's like, well, I don't really want to be spayed. And I'm like, oh shit, I've never even thought about that. Cause it's like what you do. It's like you mm-hmm. spay them because you don't want to be irresponsible or whatever. And this is like such a big discussion, but this whole like feminine energy, it's so interesting how there's so much shame around that feminine energy when it should be so powerful. I talked to a horse today that, um, the person said that her right ovary keeps like getting twisted and Mm. she said, well, it's linked to your mom who got a hysterectomy. This is what happens in my sessions now because of Amber. (laughs) I'm like picking up that this mother had a hysterectomy and the daughter is feeling responsible. And there's like something that me and the girl's like, yeah, my mom had a hysterectomy last year. She had like a cyst on her ovary and I'm like, okay, well, I don't know what to do with that, but this is why your mare keeps having a (laughs) flippy ovary. (laughs) But it's just so crazy how there's so much, um, I don't know if we do this to our horses because what we have, I talked to so many barns that are, they have the mare pasture and the gelding pasture and even like castrated Mm -hmm. males can't interact with the mares because people have a hard time with that. And it's so interesting, the separating of the sexes and the, the squashing down of the feminine energy all the time. Totally. Yeah. Even thinking of my mare, Lily, she's five, but she's like so flirty, so unapologetic. Like when I introduced her with my gelding shorty, like the squeals, he look at her, like take one look at her, like she's squealing. She's like kicking out. She's all for it. And like, so unapologetic with being that way. And I think it's interesting with this conversation about the feminine, um, because I think a lot of people think the feminine is like being very like passive and very go with the flow. And look, there's a part of that. But I think um, a point that I wanted to make is a lot of people, when they're working with their horses in a more compassionate way, they end up taking this very like uh, wounded feminine role. They've off, a lot of them have gone from a very wounded masculine role of being like, you're going to do this, I'm going to show you who's boss, that kind of thing. And then they go, oh, my God, yes, that's not the right thing to do. Go full wounded feminine and be so passive and be so like, okay, I'm not going to claim what I want at all or I'm not going to ask for space or I'm not going to set a boundary. Um, when really what they need to do is like access this like divine energy inside of them of being like unapologetic and be like, this is what I want. But like we spoke about earlier, who actually actually who actually ponders that question? Who actually sits down and goes, like, what do I want? Like, do I actually want this? Is this true for me? Like a lot of people don't do that. And I think especially with women um, or people that are further along in their life, this can feel like a big conversation because then you look back and you're like, holy shit, I haven't actually made a decision for myself this whole time. I thought I had. But this was a story that my mom told me and this was a story that a friend planted the seed for. And then I thought, oh, my goodness, I got FOMO because time's running out and I've got to do this thing. And it's just this continual layers of like shooting on ourselves and like squashing down our own ability to make a decision or like tune into our intuition. Um, So it's a big conversation. But, yeah, it's really interesting when you take a moment to stop and think, why am I doing this? Like, does this even need to happen? And how do they feel about this? Like layers but I love all of this stuff that's coming up for you in the sessions like it's really cool (laughs) you're probably like why (laughs) 
I know it's crazy. It never happened until I started like just kind of hanging out with Amber and she like asked me random questions throughout the week and it makes me think. And then I'm like, oh my God. And then I have a session where someone's grandma has this like tie to the horse and I'm like, it's all connected. It's so crazy how connected it is. Because I think for the longest time I was finding my validation through other people. And so it felt very safe for me to be able to feel into a horse's body or an animal's body and be like, this is what's going on. You can get it checked by the vet, like blah, 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 blah. Now I'm like in the whole other realm where I'm seeking more validation mm -hmm. within myself and being like pretty self-centered and like my communication abilities, I guess. And so like the animals are feeling safer to come to mm -hmm. me and be like, okay, now you're ready for this next piece. Um, which yeah. is gnarly, but yeah, the, the last part of that question, she was just curious how you embrace the divine feminine in your own life. This is something that I'm working on because my go-to is like masculine, Virgo sun, Capricorn rising, do, 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 like get shit done, that kind of thing. Um, and I'm even, which is why we had to reschedule this podcast, I'm going to retreat a retreat this weekend purely for the fact that this woman that's hosting it is the mentor that I'm working with. Um, it's a yoga retreat, but I'm like, I need to go somewhere that can actually hold space for me so I can just cry. <laughs> I need to just go somewhere to cry and this is going to be okay. <laughs> so this is something that I'm working on um, really like harnessing in my own life. And I think it just comes from like at the moment, really working with the awareness piece. Um, and I'm someone who my current thing that I'm diving into is more of the body-based somatic um, work in terms of like moving my body. Like I can do tapping up here, like neck up. I've got you covered. Like I'm so good at that. Neck down needs some work, you know? <laughs> like, so I'm really working on exploring the body-based things and I have a lot of avoidance around that. And that is why I'm going to this yoga retreat and I'm going to cry and move my body the whole time. So this is how I'm starting this journey or not starting. Actually, this is a really interesting point because I was shaming myself a lot for this, being like, oh my goodness, like how am I still, still here again? Like I've been talking about this or talking about wanting to move my body more for years now because in the past I had consistently done it but I got in a really unhealthy pattern where I was obsessed with my weight and obsessed with doing things perfectly like that, that old chestnut anyway. And then I've avoided doing it because I'm like, Oh, I'm terrified of getting back there. Like I'm terrified of being in that space again, where I'm so obsessed with my body, got all this body dysmorphia shit coming up and I'm like need to do the workout. Otherwise I've failed. I'm the worst person ever. Anyway. So I have had this inquiry for a while around like, okay, it'd be really nice if I can move my body consistently. Like it'd be really nice if I can actually do this practice just for me that doesn't have an external outcome. That's not about like how much weight you can lift or how good the fucking yoga pose is. Like just does this feel good for you? Um, and yeah, I was shaming myself for this process taking years, like for me to inquire about. But then I recognized I have done all the in, like a lot of internal work to help me get to a place now that's sending me to the yoga retreat and working with someone that's very unapologetic with her femininity. So I, that doesn't really answer the question, but I think it's more of like um, tuning into where you're at on your journey in expressing these parts of you and how that wants to come through. Um, yeah. And so if you want to say something. <laughs> No, it's so good. It, it's so good because that's, I feel like, especially in the horse world, there are a lot of women mm -hmm. very much in their masculine. And it's because you're dealing with this like thousand pound animal. You know what I mean? And the way horsemanship is taught you is like, no, you put them here. You're the leader. You make the decisions, which is all so masculine. Mm -hmm. um, and we lose the balance. And you find a lot of women who have very, in the horse world, I found that have very fem men, husband, partners, whatever, even um, yeah. same sex partnerships where they're, they're almost very much in their way out of balance in their feminine. It's just such a fascinating thing to like explore. Yeah. Because, you know, you have been kind of conditioned and told that the feminine is the weak, you know, mm -hmm. and so why would you want to be weak around your horse? You know what I mean? It's this animal, you could get hurt if you're weak. So, you know, when I just find that like the horsemanship 
that work so well is when there is like the balance of the two, you know, the boundaries and the the yeah. certainty and then the the ability to just be in the flow with it and be creative with the decisions that you make with your horse, like having the fluctuation between the two. Um, but I do think it's something that a lot of, I think we should do a thing together, by the way, the three of us, <laughs> that popped yeah. up three times. So you go to your yoga retreat. <laughs> I'll go <laughs> cry for a week, uh, for four days and um, be back. Because I, I feel like all three of us have these like really poignant, like things that were like, okay, this is definitely where I need to focus right now. But when we were talking earlier, I was just like, having an entire workshop around like, what do you want, you know, and releasing what you don't need. And then like tapping into like the intuition piece and like calling in all the things you want and how you do that and what that looks like with support and accountability. There's my (laughs) plan. Yeah, no, that would be really fun. And tuning into like, not only for the person's perspective, but for the horse's perspective as well. Like, what do they want? Because there are a lot of horses. They're like, I'm just happy to be, man. Like, just hang out with me. And love me, enjoy me. Like I only want to do things that you want to do that you find fun. And then that causes you to go in the other direction. Yeah. Now for something else you said in the beginning there that I'm, oh, that's right. With the masculine feminine thing. I was reflecting on this and I've had conversations with my students about this for a while. Um, because I don't, I'm curious to know if you would agree with this, but like, it's almost just like if you're ballroom dancing, like the horse is the feminine like archetype there and you're probably the masculine but it's like both in the divine energies because when the divine masculine is happening they're leading they've got the strong presence this is what we're doing this is where we're going I've got you and you're like okay cool I'm going wherever um and a friend of mine she did this father-daughter dance at her wedding and with the the dance that she was like it felt so good he, I just went with him we went wherever and with her dad she was like it felt awful <laughs> He was just not clear on what he was doing. He was fumbling around, didn't know where to go, didn't know if I was leading, didn't know if he was leading, didn't know what was happening. And I feel like a lot of the times we get in these situations with our horses and it's just like balancing the two and knowing that you don't have to stay in that masculine um, archetype. You can switch between the two depending on what role you want them to have and what role you want you to have, but there's a balance and it's just, it's really fascinating. There's so much energetics behind everything. Yeah. Yeah. And I love dancing. I love swing dancing. I love all the dancing. We, I used to salsa dance a lot. And I found that the hardest thing in the beginning of that process for me was actually just following and like surrendering so many different dance partners that actually knew how to dance and were not there to be creepy. They were just there because they really wanted to dance. It was such a crazy process. And it took a really long time for people being like, stop leading. And I'd be like, I don't even know what that means. I don't know what I'm doing. Like, it like your body really like holds that and it is such a very nuanced like super small shift like mm. even thoughts and like in within that makes such a huge difference with the person or horse that you're dancing with you know what I mean so I think it's a super important um thing to kind of be aware of you know that balance between the two because everyone has masculine and feminine energy you know there's a polarity yeah. that needs to happen right and to balance out when you're you know, interacting with a partner um So it's not like, I think when you said earlier about the wounded masculine and then the wounded feminine, like that's the piece that most people are kind of residing in and operating from. And that's where everything gets a little bit messy. (laughs) Totally. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I feel like I totally flip-flopped to like the wounded. That's how I got into animal communication and you Mm -hmm. saying it that way. I'm like, holy shit. That was like my whole journey (laughs) was Mm -hmm. like switching to this little wounded bird who was like, I like my horse told me all the time. He like developed my symbols for like, stop walking on eggshells. You're not going to break me. I'm not made of glass. Like all of those symbols I like have from that, that, Mm -hmm. But Amber and I just did um, a tandem session today where the horse was like, you need to allow me to get my own balance. And I do think that that's something that people do. I don't know if it's the control thing or if it's masculine or feminine, but it just made me think of the session we had today where Mm -hmm. the horse was like, you want me to be in this pretty space and you're, you know, you don't want me to be fearful yet you won't allow me to be fearful so that I can figure things out so that I can get to this other place. It's like, you want to stop me before it happens. Mm -hmm. And I do feel like 
I don't know if that would be masculine or, or what that would be, but there is, there are a lot of horses that I talk to that Mm -hmm. spook in the same corner every day, or they do this and they do that. And it's because they're never really allowed to go through those emotions on their own, figure it out, and then come to where, you know, they're okay with it. Mm. Yeah. Because they just held together through that process. But like, well, when I was taught to ride through a horse that was spooking, it was like, shorten your reins, put your legs on, flex them the other way, and you push them through that. And I remember I had this this um, horse, this Galloway, and got him as a yearling. He went to be started under saddle by this person. This was way before this horsemanship journey. And the starting experience was just not great for him. He ended up coming back wind sucking, all the things that I still thought, oh, it's fine. Anyway, um, and he spooked at a shadow at all the things. And I was so like firm with him. I was like, you're going to go over there. You're going to do like very wounded masculine, like didn't consider his feelings at all. And I remember it got to the stage where he did like get a lot um, more confident, comfortable, but there was still some stuff going on. And I got to the stage where he was in a place where like a confident child could ride him and I was selling him. When he had kids on him, did he do it? No. Because he was like, had the permission to just slow down if he wanted to slow down, like actually have a look at things rather than me being like, you're going to go there. (laughs) I'm going to make you do it. It's like, he just wanted to look at the thing. Like let him slow down and just look at the thing. Um, And even I've had clients where they'll have horses that are spooky um, in the arena or at competitions and things like that. And then I say, okay, we'll lead them around the area both times. If they want to stop and look at something, let them stop and look at it. Like let them soak into it on the ground first. And then they're fine. <laughs> or they notice that there's something, like I remember I had one dressage um, client and she took her horse somewhere for a lesson and there were like chickens roaming around by one area of the arena. And she'd gotten to the state of awareness where she was like, I'm just not going to ride down that end of the arena. I would be scared going past that too because you don't know when a bloody chicken's going to pop out. Like just you're not going to experience that at a competition. If you don't need to work through it, just avoid that area for now and come back like, who cares? Um Yeah, I'm sure we could continue taking this conversation in many different directions. (laughs) Okay, one last thing, not to bring up my eyesight again, but I'm doing it. Um, Because this sparked me with the spooking and the chickens. It's like such a real thing. So when the horse collective was like, you are like holding on so tight to like this superpower that you have. And I'm like, what is it? And they're like basically being blind. And I'm like, wow, can't believe that you're choosing that. But okay. Um, and because my eyesight is not so bad, like I, I can see pretty much like, I'm sure what a horse can see, like I can make out objects, but, and like, it's interesting. So as I've been like navigating through like this week, um, I'm noticing things that I like wouldn't normally notice because like my whole vision is blurry like I was telling Amber, um, before our call, I'm like, Oh, I, I noticed like my fan was blowing a page of a book earlier. And I would have never noticed that if my contacts were in and it has put perspective for me, like what they actually see, because obviously their, their brains and their eyesight is hardwired to see like, you know, uh, motion, like peripheral motion, but my body is adjusting to that, not having contacts in after being able to see for so long that I see out of my peripheral so much better. And it is kind of crazy how like you look at something and then you do a double take and I'm like, is that a snake? Or like, what is that? Like, I totally do look at it and I'm like, what the hell? And it's not that I'm necessarily panicked in the moment. I'm just like, what is that? And I have to get like earlier today, I was like, is that a leaf or a moth? And I had to get closer to see that it was a moth, which is so embarrassing. But I, in that (laughs) moment, I realized like I was genuinely just curious at first. Like I saw it and I was like, that's weird. Haven't seen that before. It's in a weird spot. And I was curious and it literally made me think in the moment, like how many times are our horses legitimately just curious? And we say, nope, don't look at that. And then they're like, oh shit, like, why shouldn't I look at that? And then they become fearful and then it gets stored in their body. I mean, let me tell you, this is a big, I'm going to be talking about this for like weeks to come, I feel like, but this is like a big learning experience for me. And I feel like 
now wow. I really am getting the perspective that they probably are curious at first. And then we're like screwing them over by controlling them. <laughs> yeah. So interesting. It's so cool that you're having that perspective. Um, thanks, Hawks Horse Collective. Um, but I find it really fascinating as well because obviously like in your communication sessions, you're in meditation. So you're picking up all of these things. So I'm just really curious to know like how you go on this journey in terms of your third eye strengthening perhaps and maybe your visuals becoming more clearer because you're going to be more of like seeing the unseen a little bit more or like having a little bit more depth to your experience as you attune to your vision without glasses like I'm just really that just popped in my head I'm fascinated to keep sharing your journey (laughs) I know I'm curious how it's going to unfold too I will say that I you know how when you connect to an animal like you might get some visuals but then you also have like a knowing like you just Mm -hmm. have a sense of like what you know what you feel like they're telling you I know Amber's had like many of those too that we've talked about so as I've been connecting with animals over the last couple of days, it's interesting because my vision has changed a tiny bit, just in the sense that like, I'm getting more knowings and understandings of like the bigger picture and not necessarily what I'm seeing. So like, I was connecting with a horse's body today. And normally when I connect to the body, I see color. Like that's my strength. It's like, I have all these different colors and visuals that I look at and I analyze like the muscles and like what things look like externally. And then I go from there. And this, this horse that I talked to today, it was so interesting because I was just like immediately in his body and feeling it and just having like knowings about like the past trauma and why he couldn't, why his right hawk was so stuck and couldn't take the next step forward because there was a fear of something because he's, he stepped in like a hornet's nest. And it it is interesting because losing my vision has almost like forced me into, um, I don't know. I don't know where I am right now. It's a very weird space. (laughs) I think that's cool. Yeah. It sounds like you're like tuning on to like, you're going through this period of adjustment of being like, okay, well, what you used to rely on in your communication sessions and in your day-to-day life, we're going to take that away for a bit so that you can tap into this and realize how powerful this thing is. Yeah, it's fascinating. The knowing thing just, I love it, but it, it there's always so many moments where I'll get something coming through. I'm like, like, how, like now I have to share this. And then it's always validated and you're like, how the fuck do I know this? Like, this is trippy, but cool what like yeah it's a journey I know. the knowing is like such a cool thing but that's like the basis of intuition and I I feel like I need to like encourage our listeners to still drive with their contacts but like take off your glasses for a day <laughs> or like even like ride without your glasses it's so crazy like I was hanging out with my horse I've had him for 10 years I have always thought that because I walk by him and he's like anxious. He pins his ears. He throws his head around. He's, you know, being cheeky, whatever. And the first day, nothing really changed. Second day, I didn't notice anything. Third day, I was kind of like, he's doing all the things that he normally does, but I can't see him. And all I feel from him is I'm so excited for you to come over here. Like come over Mm -hmm. here and scratch me. Like, I just want to see you. I just want to, And I have always avoided him because I'm like, oh, he's just so annoyed that I'm walking by him because I see his facial expression. And it's so crazy to me that just seeing what his face looked like and what my human mind has learned through, you know, if they pin their ears, they're unhappy. And if they have this face, they're and so my brain has created this image around him. But now that I can't see him, I kid you not, I really can't see very well. (laughs) So now that I'm walking into the barn and I just see his little bay blur, I feel his energy and he's like, come see me. Like, I want to come. It's like, I want a treat. I want you to come over here. And I'm like, wow, this is so freaking cool because I would have avoided him. I have avoided him in the past. And maybe that's why he does that in the first place. Yeah. My goodness, it's fascinating. You're going to blog about, just do a podcast series about this or something. Maybe like once a month, Shaylee shares her journey with the unseen. (laughs) Yeah, I totally should. I'm sure it'll come up in Amber and I's podcast because she always gets the brunt of like all of my realizations or my freaking outs or whatever. (laughs) (laughs) I love it. 
Well, how are you guys feeling? Is there anything else that you feeling like you need to share or that came up that you're like, I really want to be able to say this to feel complete? I feel pretty good on my end. Yeah. yeah. It was good. Yeah, me too. Super fun. Super fun. Well, if people want to find more about you, where should they go? They can go to Instagram. I'm at Felicity Davies with an underscore at the end. I'm on Facebook, Felicity Davies Horsemanship and Equestrian Perspective Podcast. Check it out. Also, interesting conversation with the feminine piece. I had a naturopath come on um, the last episode, episode 110, um, and talk all about cycles. And it's really fascinating. I had lots of messages from people being like, oh, my goodness this is amazing, but how did I not know this? I'm like, me too, me too. (laughs) Anyway, um, so yeah. How fun. Yeah, so we'll link all of those in the show notes. And it was so fun talking to you. And I do feel like we're all going to create a little workshop or something in the future. Yeah, I'm totally, I was going to say so down and then I went to say totally down. (laughs) Trying to want to cross over. Toe down. (laughs) Toe down. (laughs) Uh, people will have no fun working with all three of us I promise (laughs) (laughs) I would love it it's gonna be like so good yeah um so yay thank you so much for hanging out and we will see you guys all later thank you